My name is Rose Amador LeBeau. I am president and CEO of CTC. Our mission is to help people through employment and education become self-sufficient. We have a day worker center. We have educational programs so people can get their GEDs. We serve a variety of people, people who've just become unemployed, people who have never worked. We work with homeless people. We work with people who have just gotten out of prison and have to re-enter the workforce. So we're full service. I think it's seeing people make the change, become successful, uh, make that transition, and actually having an impact on people's lives, a positive impact. To see these success stories is what it's all about. Hello, I'm Siwapiti Rose Amador LeBeau, and you are watching Native Voice TV. Welcome to the show. I'm here with my co-host, Craig Pasqua. Hey, Craig. Hello, Rose. Welcome Hello, back. Everyone. And we have some wonderful guests. We uh, have a lot of information we're going to get from them today. But we have with us Michael Horse, and he's an actor, he's an artist, he makes jewelry, uh, he just does it all. And Penny Opal Plant. And Penny, uh, she's a native activist for women's, native women's rights and so forth, and just so many issues. But they both have a store called Gathering Tribes, which is just fantastic. So there's so much I want to learn from both of you, and uh, let's get it going. Welcome oh, to the well, show. Thank you. Could you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure, I'm uh, Yaqui and Mexican on my mom's side, and Choctaw, Cherokee, and European on my dad's side from Richmond, California. My family's been in that area since the 1930s, so for a very long time. Yeah. Richmond, mm -hmm. okay, that's close. Yeah, not too far. Close, mm -hmm. okay. Michael? I'm uh, Yaqui and part Mescalero and part European, and I'm from Southern California and Arizona. Hey, and so we have three Yaquis here. Yes. All right. <laughs> And a Modoc. And a Modoc. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That sounds like an old joke. There's three Yaki's and a Modoc who went to a bar. <laughs> Walked out to a TV set. No. <laughs> so, you know, um, Michael, you've been on Twin Peaks. Yeah. And most recently, you just did another taping or a series or yeah, it's 20, that we can binge watch. Tell us about 25 years later, it's been on Showtime, and I'm sure it'll go to Netflix. and. Uh, Twin Peaks has been pretty interesting because it actually changed the way that people process television. A lot of the new stuff that's on now, Fargo and American Gods and Legion, all have uh, Twin Peaks' DNA all, all over it. The shots, the pacing. And the character I played, the Deputy Hawk, was, a, was an interesting character. He was a very smart man. He was a, a college graduate and it held some mirrors up to some stereotypes and did away with others. and. It's been a joy to be back on it, and uh, got some other projects. I just did uh, a seven-hour miniseries for Netflix called Godless for Scott Frank, who uh, wrote Logan, and uh, it's a um, uh, kind of a get shorty of westerns, but it's about these uh, very strong women in the West, and I'm looking forward to it. And Penny and I have a, an animated series that they're wow. doing uh, out of the uh, Art Institute in San Francisco. That's just going to be wonderful. It's a, a raven and a coyote own this gas station in the middle of nowhere, and people come by and, and instead of taking money, they have to tell them stories. You know. Oh, I like that. Penny had never done this sort of thing, and I said, "You want to come and, and, and do a voice?" She was wonderful. Which one were you? The raven. She's you were the, the raven. raven. And she I didn't even want to do it. I'm too yeah, busy. But she's too busy. <laughs> and, uh, do it. she was so good at it because the raven heckles the coyote. The coyote <laughs> knows everything, and she's, you know, the raven goes, "You don't know nothing. You know, you never went there. You know." 
So uh -oh, it, it, is that a reflection of? Yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> she, so she came it's, up with her own lines. <laughs> it's, it's been a lot of fun, and I have a little um, sci-fi movie coming out called Dead ah. Ant. And Dead it, Ant. Dead Ant, A-N-T, which is uh, kind of a cross between the 50s sci-fi film Them about giant ants and the Spinal Tap and Road Warrior, which is Whoa. Mm, pretty, pretty, pretty <laughs> interesting. Yeah, but uh, you know, I busy doing play acting, and my amazing activist wife is out there fighting to make the world a safer, cleaner, fairer place for everybody. It's an mm. honor to be her husband. Oh, uh, that's nice to say. And I do so see, Patty, you're, you're here and there and speaking at this rally and that rally. What have you been working on? Um, the Indigenous Women of the Americas Defending Mother Earth Treaty is a big part of my life. And uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Idle No More SF Bay. Uh, which we decided to keep the name. We've been around since 2013, and I'm also co-founder of an organization called Movement Rights, which works with municipalities and tribal nations in uh, using local law or writing constitutions to protect their lands from, you know, any kind of harm. The fossil fuel industry is a big one, fracking and uh, protection of the waters, and yeah, so I'm a little busy. Is fracking yes. going on? It was a, yeah, just a little. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> is fracking going on in California? Oh, yeah. yeah it is. Yes, absolutely. Down Bakersfield and area? And yes, stuff. and uh, about, I think it's been about three years ago now, you know, our Governor Brown runs around the world calling himself a climate hero, mm -hmm. and he has allowed, he's like in bed with the fossil fuel industry. I'm definitely not a fan of his. And he, under his watch, the Oil and Gas Commission here in the state of California was allowed to put fracked water, it's called produced water, into over 500 of our aquifers that were federally set aside for human consumption. Hmm. And uh, I was at the UN climate talks in 2015 in Paris and had an opportunity to call him out at this big fancy event. Um, didn't expect I was going to do that, but I found myself rising up out of my seat as he was leaving early. He was supposed to be there to host this panel of governors who were very involved in a program called RED. It's part of the cap and trade program that is part of the new bill that was just passed, AB 398, which um, has, has already thrown people, indigenous people, out of their forests. So. People go in, let's say from France or the United States or somewhere, they go into these forests where indigenous people only exist because they have fought so hard to be in their forests, to remain in their forests. The trees are counted, the amount of carbon that the trees are supposed to clean is equated into dollars. And what happens, this has already happened in Nigeria where the money goes from the carbon trading market to the, to the country and then to the state, and then to the municipality, and then to the tribe. So you can imagine all those steps where the money is siphoned off. Mm -hmm. So by the time it gets to the tribe, then they, one thing, they're not getting that much money, and for another thing, there have already been people evicted. This is California AB? Well, uh, California 398, the AB yeah. 398, which Who's was passed. That bill? Oh, it's already Who's passed. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. and it, it, Jerry Brown went hand in hand with the fossil fuel industry to write the bill with Western States Petroleum. So here we are in California, you know, and California is one of the states which is doing the most progressive things around climate that, that they think that they're doing the right thing. But in doing, in, in capitalizing, in putting dollar amounts on trees, that's, remember when Chief Seattle, that quote that says, how can you sell the air? Mm -hmm. Well, they finally figured out how to do that, how to sell the air. And these are forests that have, for millions of years, already been cleaning the air and sequestering carbon. So it's not like the forests are gonna do anything differently. They're, that's what they've always done. But they've figured out how Chevron, which is what Michael and I see every day, because it's directly across from where our house, um, and Chevron, can buy these carbon trading credits that allows them to continue po to pollute my community. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really, uh, it's like a shell game, you know? 
That's all it is. It's and a shell game. And the state relies upon this cap and trade to now raise money for so many other things, not just. Um, and you can you can see it whenever they sponsor a bill or something, we'll get the money out of cap and trade. So Which we'll that system has already proven not to work very well, not only in the state of California, but also in the United States and around the world. It has failed. So I don't I don't understand how they think that all of a sudden they're going to make this system work when it doesn't work for us, the air, the water, anything anyway. It's mm -hmm. not working for that. What it's doing is it, it's allowing these polluting industries like the fossil fuel industry, chemical companies, and so on to continue to pollute until 2030. That's essentially what it's allowing them to do. So instead of saying, okay, how do we, how do we make sure that our water is protected? And let's mm -hmm. not put fracked water, fracked fluid into the water supply. Let's just stop doing that completely. How do we, how do we transition from gas-powered cars to electric cars? How do we make more renewable energy sources available for all of the utility companies? Like that, that is the point of the spear of where we need to go. Not c to continue to capitalize, mm -hmm. to put into the capitalist system these mechanisms that are hurting people that are continuing to allow these corporations to poison us. Exactly. It just, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's, they, they want to make it really complicated so that we don't understand what's actually happening. But Did you get a response from Jerry Brown? Oh, he was very embarrassed. Oh, good. I called him out. I, I stood up and I said, I'm from Richmond, California. We say no to RED. That's the program that's hurting indigenous people. We say no to Chevron continuing to poison our communities. And by that time, all of the other people that were with me, were part of the indigenous delegation had stood up and were shouting, no red. Um, and two of my really good friends were shaking their fingers in his face. And he actually said several times, we're not going to participate in red. Well, it's a lie. You know, politicians, you can't expect them oh, to yeah. tell the truth. It's been my experience. Yeah. You can't yeah. really expect yeah, them to tell us the truth, just like with people corporate do officials. To help you. Well, not it's help not you, helping help, me. But I mean, how can you know, people get involved? Yeah, help, help, but our, how can help people each get other. Involved? Because people, right? A lot of people don't know, and they, then those who some that do know, don't do anything. So right. we need to get people involved. <laughs> so um, I have two parts to that answer, uh -huh. and one is uh, I'm one of the original signers on the Indigenous Women of the Americas Defending Mother Earth Treaty, which actually came out of the climate talks in Peru in 2014. Um, and Casey Camp Hornick, she's a Ponca leader, elder, mm -hmm. brought that back. And we, uh, a group of women wrote the treaty. So the treaty goes through all of the, the history of how we arrived to this point, basically. Mm -hmm. And what's being caused by climate disruption, like these massive hurricanes, the fires, it goes through a whole litany mm -hmm. of issues that we're dealing with now. And then it calls on women who are signers to do two things, two obligations to signing. One is to conduct a new moon ceremony every month, which we, our crew has been doing since October of 2015. The treaty was first signed October 27th of 2015 during UN Climate Week in New York. Um, and the new moon ceremonies are an opportunity to explain to people that come Everyone comes to ours, men, women, all different ethnicities. Um, we t give an update on what's happening in our world and what's happening locally that we can participate in and praying for wisdom and guidance and how we are to move forward because obviously our human family hasn't done a very good job. And so we ask for that spiritual guidance to let us know you know, where are we to go and how are we to do this? Mm -hmm. And we do it with love because we're women, right? The other obligation is on every equinox and solstice to go and do a nonviolent direct action. So ours was yesterday um, at the Bay Area Air Quality Management District office. So they're meeting yesterday in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And we focused on a very local issue. The Phillips 66 refinery in Rodeo wants to be permitted to build a huge oil terminal that would bring an additional 100 oil tankers through the bay into Rodeo. So we're not talking about conventional oil. More than likely, it's going to be tar sands, where our relatives up in Canada, our Cree relatives, 
are dealing with, it's horrible. They go and they've scraped off this huge area almost the size of England. So all of the trees, all of the habitats for the medicine plants and the deer and the elk and all of the salmon and you know the fish, just throw it away mm -hmm. and then make this huge, awful, fracking nightmare of the tar sands. So that oil ch -ch -ch, from Alberta tar sands to the west coast and then into these tankers. So the biggest problem with that is that tar sands oil is heavy. It's really thick and gooey and it sinks to the bottom. And I don't know if you remember a few years ago in Kalamazoo, Michigan, it was five years ago, there was a tar sands oil leak in a mm -hmm. neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And that oil is still in that lake. It's impossible to clean. So it's there emitting toxins, not only into the water, but into the air. So I don't think any of us want that in our bay or anywhere else. Right. So we're working really hard to prevent that from happening. And I was able to talk to the representatives there in that meeting of Philip 66. And I walked up to them with my big open heart and a big smile on my face and let them know that we're the group that had 5,000 people in the streets during uh, the Standing Rock and stopping mm -hmm. the Dakota Access Pipeline and San Francisco at the Army Corps of Engineers. And you know, there's been a lot of people that have woken up. And if you continue with this permit, we will have thousands of people locking down this refinery. And so that's going to cost Philip 66 millions of dollars. So you might as might want to consider just mm. tossing that permit aside. What was their response? Yeah, it, they always are stunned that you know somebody comes very friendly and especially mm -hmm. an older woman and talks to them and shakes all their hands and they're they're always just stunned. They kind of look at me like, what did she just <laughs> say? Uh <-huh. laughs> no, oh how do I, what do I do with this information? Mm -hmm. You know. Now I feel I feel a connection there because I grew up in Oklahoma mm -hmm. in Bartlesville, which is the headquarters for Phillips Petroleum Company. Right. And um, in fact, I have a picture of myself and the CEO of Phillips, which is Mr. Keeler, who was also the chief of the Cherokees, and um, when I was a little kid. And uh, um, but yeah, that was a a big company, a big yeah. part of my life. Yeah, they ruled the town. And I think you know back then we didn't know our. No, hu none of our human family, and I just speak collectively, we didn't know what the result of burning fossil fuels would be. Right. You know, so I don't, I don't have any ill will for any of those folks from the beginning that, you know, it was like bringing money into a lot of tribal nations and doing a lot of good work, but now we, well, we know. know. Now we know. Now we know, and yeah. I'm a grandma. Well, we were out at Ponca, and I was actually, we were standing outside of fracking wells, and it's big pools of this fracking fluid, it looks like radiator fluid, your eyes water and you know, my lungs started to hurt and mm -hmm. they're getting rare cancers that you know, they shouldn't be getting and their animals are dying and you know, and they're growing food. We saw, you know, uh, um, big fields where they're growing soybeans and corn mm -hmm. and we've seen the fracking fluid come up out of these fields, you know, and they just don't care. Yeah, and that, mm -hmm. I think that's, yeah. that's a really good takeaway is that the fossil fuel industry does not care about us. That's true. You That's know, if, true. They, if they cared about us, they would already have started their transition. So another, one of the other fellows I talked to yesterday works with Chevron. And, um, you know, I went, hey, you know, this is who I am, and how are you doing? And I live near Chevron. And um, I said, I asked him, how, how, how is Chevron going to transition to make this transition? You know, how do we get there? because we all want, know we need to go there. You know, we need to get through the eye of this mm -hmm. needle in order to save the, it's the environment for our children. You know, it's not looking very good right now. And he said, well, you know, um, it's, it's really going to depend on demand, our, the, our demand of fossil fuel. And so when I went back to our, we had a teach in there too, outside of mm -hmm. the, where the meeting was happening. You know, and I told people what had just occurred, and and I said, so, you know, let's let's all do our own research and see where where does fossil fuel, what is that creating? It's creating all the plastics, 
all the rubber, like I have rubber soled shoes on right now. Mm -hmm. um, it creates a lot of the, it goes into a lot of the makeup that women wear. All of those plastic straws, you know. We can all do this one thing that's so simple. I mean, you asked what could people do. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And then there's what, I ask people, what were you born? What are your gifts and what makes you happy? And apply that to remedying the climate disruption that's happening. Like, are you an artist? Are you a singer? Do you, do you like to write? You know, are you somebody that can stand up and speak? Because I was never comfortable with that, but now I, I have to stand in front of groups of thousands of people mm -hmm. and speak. So there is this thing that we're all required to do right now to step outside of our comfort zone. But start with, with, with what's comfortable for you. And there are plenty, plenty of organizations. And any indigenous women that are, that are watching the show, you can sign this treaty. You can organize these new moon events. And the, the, it's been really successful. So there's been women that have signed the treaty from Alaska all the way down into Ecuador and other South American com countries. So this is a country that put a man on the moon and built the most heinous mm -hmm. weapon in the world, you know, figure it out. Yeah. You know, and you'll make money at it too. I mean, it's obviously where the new economy is going to figure out these alternative sources yeah, of energy. Yeah, exactly. You know. And you know, I, some of these lawmakers, legislators, and it's like, don't you realize that this water will affect your kids oh, somehow? Yeah. What do they think? That the, the food you're eating yeah. will affect your grandkids, yeah. your great grandkids. It's like it doesn't register. Yeah. There's a disconnect. There There's is, disconnect, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and they start on the reservations, it seems like, you yeah. know, in South Dakota and wow. th with the, the pipeline, and they still did that, and they're still doing it in the Cheyenne River. Well, but there are, the there, are two, there are a couple of lawsuits pending <coughs> for the Dakota Access Pipeline. So that's not a done deal. You know, those are still in motion right now. And there, ha there was a, a successful lawsuit, unfortunately, I can't remember which nation it was, but you might know, um, where they, they s successfully sued to get the pipeline off of their, that's already, that was already there because there was no consent originally hmm. for that pipeline. So the, the fossil fuel industry has to go out and take that pipeline out and figure out where they're going to move them. But we, we have, just in the Bay Area here, over 500 miles of oil pipelines. Hmm. Well, they're giving me some kinds of signs out there, and I can't believe we're going to... This yeah. is another show coming up. I know we have a lot to talk about, but I'm admiring your beautiful jewelry, your oh, your yeah. bracelet. Tell me about that. I made that for myself. I, you know, you I made that? Yes. I, all my family were artists. They were jewelers and potters and painters, and I've been doing this since I was a kid. And that's basically what I am. I'm an artist. I, I got in the movies all by accident. You know, I was the worst rodeo rider in, in the whole world. And <laughs> I used to wrangle horses on movies when I was a kid. And one day they said, we, we need somebody to ride across the, the desert here. We're going to shoot a gun and you fall off like you're shot. And I went, I fall off, I get paid? <laughs> I've, been the, I've been in the wrong end of this. It's been the staying on part that's hard. So that's kind of how I got into business. But yeah, I, uh, my favorite thing is to still make jewelry. You know, uh, and you're, you're an artist too. I yeah, mean, I do, do a type of painting called ledger art. You know, we used to paint on hides. That was our history book, our calendar. Uh -huh. Could roll it up, take it with us. And then, on the reservation, we painted on scrap paper, mostly on the pages of the ledger books that brought records that came to the forts and settlements yeah. and to the reservation itself. So, there's about four or five of us that actually brought this this art form back. You know, wow, mm. so that is beautiful. Oh, Tell me you. about gathering tribes. Yeah, I opened it in 1991. It's uh, on Solano Avenue in Albany. It's kind of how I met Michael. Yeah. <laughs> and he's one of our artists that we... Yeah, it's Penny store. There. I don't have anything to do with you it. You just make the jewelry for it. Yeah, I very... Yeah, I don't it's even, very supportive. <laughs> yeah, we've got yeah. jewelry from all over. You know, we don't I've recognize been there. these... We don't it's recognize amazing. the borders. It's all the way from the, the tip to the top, you yeah, know? Yeah, we represent indigenous artisans from Alaska to Chile. Yeah. And, I, and I enjoy welcoming people to Native America when they come into my store. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, What can someone find America. in your store? I've been in there, but tell our yeah, audience. We have lots of fine art, pottery, Pueblo pottery, Mata Ortiz pottery. We have one of the largest collections of Zuni uh, fetish carvings in probably in the state of California. I have adopted family and Zuni, and so we have a lot of 
carvers that come out from there. We have a lot of weekend artist events with jewelers and you know it's it's very exciting and there's a whole community around it. And we always have a jar on the counter where we're raising money for you know people affected by whatever disaster is happening at the time. It's so really we, interesting we, when we go back to like I'm in Santa Fe and people find out that Penny has a gallery and they go we want to come and show your gallery and I said mm -hmm. well it's it's small and they go yeah but we used to live in Oakland yeah. You know, yeah. it's a lot of Native yeah. people that, you know, that, that, that their family came here during relocation and then they went back home, but yeah. they all want to come back and visit Oakland again, you know. And all, yeah. all of the women that work there are Native American, so that's mm -hmm. always nice. And where is it located yeah. again? It's uh, at 1412 Solano Avenue in Albany, and mm -hmm. it's easy to find on uh, the web, gatheringtribes.com. And what days are you open? Every day. Every day. Yeah, we're right. open every There's no day. Excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I we think we're only open day of the week. <laughs> a few days out of the year we're closed. And we can find jewelry such as uh, Michael makes there oh, and yeah. the all wearing and so there, forth. Yeah. Beautiful jewelry. Every all prices, everything from really inexpensive earrings on up to you know, turquoise is getting pretty rare. It's getting mm -hmm. really it's expensive. You know, most of the mines are all mined out and Chinese are buying a lot of it. They came up to one of the big mines mm. last year with a big bag just full of money and bought everything that the guy had. So each oh year wow. I see it going, you know, up and up and, you know, the same pieces that you used to buy for $200 are like $800 now because of the, the rarity of turquoise. Oh, wow. That's the Indian gold. Yeah. If you need a go well, the standard, you need yeah. something <laughs> to hang on to. Oh, that's a pretty turquoise. good investment. Yeah. I've, seen, yeah, I've seen it go up probably five, six hundred percent, man, in my, oh my, in my career. Yeah. So. Wow. Mm. Okay, so we have to watch, uh, let's see, Twin Peaks. We're going to yeah. check yeah. out Twin Peaks on Showtime. On and that's Showtime, the second yeah. uh, se a season or series? Or the how third is it? season is 25 years later. We did it back mm -hmm. in the 90s. Right, and I never right. thought it would come back. And, but it's got a pretty good following. A lot of young people. Uh -huh. It will crack Penny up. We'll be going to the movies in Berkeley or something. She goes, those kids are following you. I go, can I help you? They go, are you Deputy Hawk? And yeah, and they yep. just go crazy. Uh, okay, <laughs> okay, well, Deputy so Hawk, I need your autograph before you leave today. Uh, we're going to wind up the show because they're giving me dirty looks over there. <laughs> but thank well, you both so for being oh, here. I know. A, a we have to bring you yeah. back because yeah. I want to know more. Yeah. We need to educate our everybody <laughs> because it affects yeah. everybody it does yeah. affect everybody and the generations to come and you know if you have kids nieces nephews if you're grandma or grandpa it's our duty it is to yeah. ensure that they have a survivable future yeah, I just, we're coming I, back i, I just love the community up here okay and they'll make a talk about their movie they're gonna make about their lives right <laughs> <laughs> okay well thank you for joining us and we'll see you again next week